This video is part of an audiobook series featuring The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, and Islam by Douglas Murray in 2017. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel, find me on Spotify, or visit my website for downloads. Chapter 3. The Excuses We Told Ourselves Throughout the late 20th and early 21st century, European governments pursued policies of mass immigration without public approval. Yet, such vast societal change cannot be forced upon a society against its will without a series of arguments being brought along to help ease the case. The arguments that Europeans have, had, have been given during this period range across the moral and the technocratic. They also shift according to need and the political winds. So, for instance, it has often been claimed that immigration on this scale is an economic benefit for our countries, that in, any, that in an aging society, increased immigration is necessary, that in any, immigra in, in any case, immigration makes our societies more cultured and interesting, and that even if none of these were the case, globalization makes mass immigration unstoppable. Such justifications have a tendency to become intertwined and mutually replaceable so that if one fails the others one fails the others are always there to fall back upon they will start with economic arguments but they can just as well start with moral arguments if mass immigration doesn't make you a richer person then it will make you a better person and if it doesn't make your country a better country then it will at least make it a richer country over time, each of these arguments has produced sub-industries of people devoted to proving their truth. In each case, the rationale comes after the events, so as to give the final impression of justifications being sought for events, which would have happened anyway. Excuse number one, economics. Over recent years, there has been, for instance, a niche search to prove that the societal change Europe has been going through makes the continent significantly richer. In fact, the opposite is true, as anybody who lives in a 21st century welfare state can work out for themselves. Having paid into the system for all of their working lives, working Europeans know that the basis of the modern welfare state broadly consists on being able to take services out of the state, like when you fall Ill, Ill become unemployed, or reach retirement, because you have paid into the system throughout your working life. There will be some people who have rarely paid in, but they will be covered by some who have rarely taken out. Anybody, who can, anybody can see that a family of people who arrive for the first time in their adopted country and have no, never paid into the system are at the very least going to take some time before they have paid in as much taxes as they, as they have will taken out in housing, schooling, welfare, benefits, and all the other advantages of the European welfare state. In the same way, it is obvious to anybody involved in the labor market, especially at the lower end, that one which is comparatively closed off will operate differently from one in which the workforce can come from almost anywhere in the world. Although from an employer's viewpoint, there is an obvious advantage to the mass import of cheap labor, it is equally obvious that a very open labor market will see people at the lower end of that market edged out of jobs by people from countries where wages and living standards are far lower and who are therefore willing to work for lower pay. Other parts of this case are equally obvious. For instance, the United Kingdom has had a housing shortage for many years. Significant portions of Greenbelt land have to be built upon to make up a, short to make up a shortage of housing which by 2016 meant that 240,000 new homes had to be built each year, or roughly one every few minutes. Even taking into account an increase in people living alone, this 240,000 figure is presented as just an unavoidable fact of life. But it is not just an unavoidable fact of life. This number of new homes have to be built in order to house all the new people who come into Britain each year. Indeed, with immigration at the rate it has been in recent years, the UK needs to build a city the size of Liverpool every year. But of course, construction has not kept up with demand. It is the same with school places. The shortage of school places in Britain is not an urban myth, nor a product of any increase in the birth rate among people already in the UK. It is the product of new arrivals into the country needing to send their children to school. 
by 2018, it is estimated that 60% of local authorities will be suffering a shortage of primary school places. Similar stretches are occurring in the National Health Service, which spends more than 20 million euros a year on translation services alone. Sorry, 20 million pounds. And in every other area of state provision. Because such things are so obvious, it requires a concerted effort to pretend that they are untrue. One example of just such an effort is a report that that a foundation document for the wave of mass immigration during the Blair Migration, this was titled Migration, an Economic and Social Analysis, completed in 2000, a joint production of the Home Office Economics and Resource Analysis Unit and the Cabinet Office Performance and Innovation Unit. See, even their names are seemingly designed to bore any opponents to inattention. Both entities were staffed with people already known to be in favor of mass immigration and therefore clearly intended to provide intellectual ballast to support the existing views of ministers. Among the claims of the seminal report was that, overall, migrants have aggregate effect on native wages or employment, or have little aggregate effect. One of the ways is It argued this was by painting exceptional migrants as being the norm and simply insisting that there is little evidence that native workers are harmed by migration. It went on to say that levels of entrepreneurship and self-employment also appear to be high among migrants and higher among migrants in the UK than those elsewhere in Europe. For example, it has been estimated by Le Figaro or Le Figaro that 150,000 French entrepreneurs have moved to the UK since 1995, attracted in part by better transport links through the Channel Tunnel. These have included internet and other high-tech ventures. One example cited was a computer design firm that had relocated to Ashford, Kent. After decades of immigration from the third world, to paint a a French high-tech entrepreneur as a typical migrant requires a considerable level of dishonesty. Most people who came to Britain in the period after the Second World War were not highly educated, but poorly, and from poor societies. That was why they wanted to better their lot by coming here. And among those who had qualifications, many were, in any case, entering a society where these qualifications were not recognized as having parity and so they had to start down the chain in their profession. But the only way to present migrants as contributing, not just equally but actually more than those already working and paying taxes in Britain, as if we talk almost exclusively about highly educated, high net worth individuals from first world countries. The cliché of the average immigrant being an economic boon for the country only works when such exceptions are made to appear as though they are the rule. All efforts to make an economic case for mass immigration rely on this trick. Among those to have used it are EU Commissioner Cecilia Malmström and UN Representative Peter Sutherland. In a 2012 piece, they suggested that unless Europe opens its borders to mass immigration, quote, entrepreneurs, migrants with PhDs, and others will be all flocking to places like Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia, Mexico, China, and India, thus leaving Europe to be a more impoverished place, end quote. One of the few studies in this area is from the Center for Research and Analysis of Migration at the University College London. It is a study that is widely cited. In 2013, the center published a working paper titled, quote, The Fiscal Effects of Immigration to the UK, end quote, it was the title. This working paper, rather than a finished report, was exceptionally widely covered in the media. The BBC ran the story as a lead item with the headline, Recent Immigrants to UK Make Net Contribution. The story claimed that far from being a drain on the system, the financial contribution of recent immigrants to the country had instead been remarkably strong. Following the lead of UCL's own positively spun press release, the national media focused on the claim that the recent waves of immigrants, i.e. those who arrived since 2000 and who had thus driven the stark increase in the UK's foreign-born population, had, quote, contributed far more in taxes than they received in benefits, end quote. Elsewhere, The study made the claim that far from being a cost to the taxpayer, immigrants were far less likely to be a financial burden on the state than the people of the country they were moving into. It also claimed that recent migrants were less likely to need social housing 
than British people and were even 45% less likely to be receiving state benefits or tax credits than UK natives. Doubtless, some members of the public hearing this claim wondered when all the Somalis, Pakistanis, and Bangladeshis had managed to put so much money into the exchequer. But the study had performed the usual sleight of hand. It had presented the best off and least culturally strange immigrants as in fact being typical immigrants. So the UCL study focused attention on highly educated immigrants and in particular on recent immigrants from the European economic area like the EU plus Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein. The working paper highlighted the fact that these people paid 34% more in taxes than they, than they received in benefits, while native British people paid 11% less in taxes than they received in benefits. Anybody doubting the financial benefits of mass immigration was suddenly opposed to wealthy residents of Liechtenstein transferring to the United Kingdom for work. Yet anyone who wanted to delve into this working paper would discover that the reality was wholly different from the spin that the media and even the university from which it hailed had given to the findings. For although UCL's own estimate suggested that recent migrants from the EEA between 2001 and 2011 had contributed around £22 billion into the UK economy, the fiscal impact of all migrants, regardless of origin, told an entirely different story. Indeed, recent arrivals from the EEA were the sole migrants for whom such a positive claim could be made. Away from the spin, what UCL's own research quietly showed was that non-EEA migrants had actually taken out around £95 billion more in services than they had paid in taxes, meaning that if you took the period 1995 to 2011 and included all immigrants, not just the convenient high net worth selection, <clears throat> then by UCL's own measurements, immigrants to the UK had taken significantly more out than they had put in. Mass migration, in other words, had made the country very significantly poorer over the period in question. After some criticism for its methodology, manner of spinning, and burial of crucial data, the following year UCL published its completed findings. By that point, in taking into account only UCL's own figures, the results were even starker. For the full report showed that the earlier figure of $95 billion far understated the cost of immigration to Britain. In fact, over that 1995 to 2011 period, immigrants had cost the UK a figure more like $114 billion, with the final figure potentially as high as £160 billion. Pounds. Needless to say, the discovery that immigration had actually cost the UK more than £100 billion pounds did not make the news, and nobody was aware on their news bulletins of a headline that should have read, Recent immigrants to the UK cost British taxpayers more than £100 billion. Pounds. How could they have done when the crucial findings didn't even make it into the conclusions of the publication that had discovered them? When it comes to immigration, the same standards of proof apply everywhere, as do the same processes of reverse engineering. For its 2000 report into migration, the British government went to two of the academics most noted for their views in favor of mass immigration, Sarah Spencer and Jonathan Portes, to find justification for the policies that politicians like Barbara Roche wanted to pursue. For such work, the usual standards of academic rigor did not apply. Wherever a claim was desirable, evidence was found to support it. Wherever a situation existed that was deemed undesirable, there was said to be either no evidence or merely anecdotal evidence. There was, for instance, only anecdotal evidence that high concentrations of migrant children lacking English as a first language can lead to pressure on schools and to some concern among other parents. Not only anecdotal, but an anecdote heard from only some. It also explained that it was only in theory that mass immigration may increase pressure on housing markets, transport, and other infrastructure, and exacerbate overcrowding and congestion. The reality, it aimed to suggest, was wholly different. How could anyone imagine that an influx of more people would require more houses? These were hardly surprising findings from authors with a track record of being in favor of mass migration as a good in itself. But while their work presented itself as an economic analysis of the benefits of migration, it was, in fact, not just a blueprint for societal change, but a cheerleader for it. 
In arguing the case for mass immigration, the authors insisted that migrant children would bring greater diversity into UK schools. All potential concerns for British workers were similarly swept aside. There was, for instance, little evidence that native workers are harmed by large-scale immigration. In fact, migrants will have no effect on the job prospects of natives. The assertion of figures such as Spencer and Portis from the fringes of academia into Whitehall gave their opinions not only the veneer of respectability, but the stamp of government. After publication of their report, ministers like Roche had something to point to when they insisted that mass migration brought unadulterated economic benefits. And if anybody wonders how the Labour government let immigration run away so wildly under its watch, it is in part because of the oiling effect of work like this. The reality is that whatever its other benefits, the economic benefits of immigration accrue almost solely due to the migrant. It is migrants who are able to access public facilities that they, they have not previously paid for. It is migrants who benefit from a wage higher than they could earn in their home country. And it is very often the money that they earn, or much of it, which is sent outside the UK to the family, rather than even being put back into the local economy. Those elements of the media which push the argument that mass migration makes everyone richer and that we all rise on a tide of wealth created by immigrants continually forget this one crucial thing. Even when the GDP of a country does grow, as it must with an ever-increasing number of people in the workforce, that does not mean individuals benefit from it. On the contrary, only GDP per head or per capita does that, and there is no evidence that mass migration improves GDP per capita. Which is why, having lost this argument, advocates of mass migration tend to move on to others. An aging population. If the economic argument for mass migration rests on the attraction of a bribe, then the outline of a threat hangs over another of the central justifications for migration on such a scale. This argument insists that Europeans are aging, that Europe is a graying society, and that in such a situation we need to bring in more people, because otherwise, our society will not have enough young people around to keep older Europeans in the lifestyle to which they have become accustomed. That is, once, this is once again one of the arguments of EU Commissioner Cecilia Malmström and UN Representative Peter Sutherland, both prominent international authorities on, and advocates of, mass migration. In 2012, they argued that, quote, the aging of Europe's population is historically unprecedented. The number of workers will decline precipitously and could shrink by almost one-third by mid-century, with immense consequences for Europe's social model the vitality of its cities, its ability to innovate and compete, and for relations among generations as the old become heavy, heavily reliant on the young. And while history suggests that countries that welcome newcomers' energy and vibrancy compete best internationally, Europe is taking the opposite tack by tightening its borders, end quote. The best answer is to this challenge both both conclude, the best answer to this challenge, both experts conclude, is to bring in the next generation from abroad. Before noting why this is such a poor argument, it is worth acknowledging the small kernel of truth within it. In order for a population to, retain, to remain at a stable level, it is necessary for that population to have a fertility rate of around 2.1. That is, in order to maintain native population growth in the long term, every two people would need to have 2.1 children. Across Europe in recent years, this fertility rate has fallen below these levels. Portugal's fertility rate in 2014, for instance, was a mere 1.23, a factor that, if left unaddressed, would see the population almost halve in the next generation. At the turn of the millennium, there was not one European city whose birth rate was at the crucial 2.1 level. Some, most notably Germany, at 1.38, were far below it. Interestingly, there was a time when parties to the far left, and in particular green parties in the West, used to campaign for precisely such an outcome in order to reduce population explosion. They argued, for instance, and despite the unsavory connotations after China's enforcement of a similar policy, that in order to maintain an optimum population for the world, every couple should restrict themselves to having one child. 
it was expected that developed countries might lead the way. It is a minor it is a point of minor interest that as third world migration to Europe has swelled, the green movements have ceased to argue for population caps or to campaign for restrictions on reproduction. While happy to tell white Europeans to stop breeding, they become somewhat more reticent about the idea of making the same request of darker-skinned migrants. Nevertheless, the idea that Europeans have simply stopped having children and must as a result ensure that the next generation is comprised of immigrants is a disastrous fallacy for several reasons. The first is because of the mistaken assumption that a country's population should always remain the same, or indeed continue rising. The nation-states of Europe include some of the most densely populated countries on the planet. It is not at all obvious that the quality of life in these countries will improve if the population continues growing. What is more, when migrants arrive in these countries, they, bring, they move to the big cities, not to the remaining sparsely populated areas. So, although among European states, Britain, along with Belgium and the Netherlands, is one of the most pop densely populated countries, England taken on its own would be the second most densely populated country in Europe. Migrants tend not to head to the highlands of Scotland or the wilds of Dartmoor. And so a, const a constantly increasing population becomes or causes population problems in the areas that are already suffering housing supply problems and where infrastructure like public transport struggles to keep up with sw swiftly expanding populations. Anybody concerned about quality of life for Europeans would wonder about how to lessen their populations, not substantially increase them. But let us say that immigration is needed simply in order to keep the population level static, if that were the case. If it is agreed that a particular country wishes to maintain a stable or slowly growing population, then before importing people from other states, it would surely be more sensible to determine whether there are reasons why people in your own country are not at present having enough children. Is it because they do not want them, or because they do not have, or because they do not want them but cannot have them? If it is the latter, then the question should be whether there is anything the government can do to create a situation in which people can have the children they want. The evidence from most countries, including the United Kingdom, is that although the native population is below replacement levels, this is not because people do not want to have children. Indeed, the figures show the opposite. For instance, in 2002, at a central point of the labor government immigration explosion, a population study from the ONS showed that only 8% of British women did not want to have babies, and only 4% wanted only one baby. The most popular desire of British women, the aim of a clear 55%, was two. A further 14% wanted three, and another 14% wanted four, 5% wanted five or more which, if you were seeking a stable or slowly growing population pyramid, would more than cover for the 8% of women who wanted no children at all. Why are Europeans having too few children? This question has been approached from a biological as well as a sociological angle in recent years, but there is one missing observation that many Europeans will recognize. A middle or average income couple in most European countries worries about having even just one child and how they will afford that child, including suffering the loss of one household salary for at least a period of time. Having two children entails even more concern and even more worries. Almost every European will know at least some couples who are good in both jobs, who are both in good jobs, and who would never feel able to afford to have a third child. In fact, only three types of people now have three children or more the very rich, the poor, and the recent immigrants. Among immigrants, especially those who have come from third world countries, any provision for their children paid for by the European welfare state will be better than anything they could have expected in their country of origin. Whereas native Europeans are concerned about competition for school places, housing shortages pushing average house prices up between five and ten times average salary in their area, and how to afford one child, let alone three or four. It is also possible that, contra Spencer and Portas, some parents may not appreciate an endless amount of diversity in their local schools and may want their children to be educated around people from a similar cultural background. This means, especially if those parents are in inner city area or suburb, that they are likely to worry about being able to afford a house in a kind of middle class neighborhood from which their child would be in the catchment area of a less diverse school. If they cannot afford to bring up their children in the way in which they would like, many people will fail to have the number of children they would like. 
The question of what your country is going to look like in the future also poses a huge question about the issue of producing, as well as raising the next generation. When people are, are optimistic about the future, they tend to be optimistic about bringing children into the world. However, if they contemplate a future filled with ethnic or religious fragmentation, they may well think again about whether this is a world they want to bring their children into. If European governments are really so worried about population decline that they would contemplate bringing in higher reproducing populations from other parts of the world, it would be sensible for them first to work out whether there are policies that could encourage more procreation among their existing populations. In Poland, for instance, the Justice and Law Party has in recent years raised child benefit in order to try to raise the native birth rate and diminish any reliance on immigration. At the very least, Governments should examine whether there are things they are currently doing that are making things worse. Then there is the issue of a graying population. It is true that people in Europe live longer today than at any previous period in their history. Barring any major war or pestilence, medical advances should allow the next generation to live even longer still. And of course, although living longer is often painted as a terrible burden, indeed a scourge on society, it should perhaps be remembered that for most individuals, it is rather a good thing. It can also be present a whole set of benefits for the rest of society, not least by balancing a cultural obsession with youth against the experience of age. The scourge of a graying population is only a scourge when it is depicted as such. In any case, even if you agreed that longevity is a curse for society, there are many things you might do before deciding to import the next generation from, from another continent. In the period following the Second World War, people were expected to live for a few years after they retired. Today, they are expected to live a couple of extra decades. The obvious solution to this economic challenge is to raise the retirement age in order to ensure that in retirement, people are not taking out more in pensions and health care provisions than they put in during their years of work. In some countries, this is happening naturally. For instance, between 2004 and 2010, the average retirement age in Britain rose by a year, 63 to 64 for men and 61 to 62 for women. Admittedly, this is neither always such an easy nor a voluntary process. After the financial crash of 2008 and the successive Eurozone crises, Greek citizens saw their retirement ages rising. Until then, those covering a large and rather eccentric collection of professions – hairdressers, radio announcers, trombonists – these were allowed to retire in their 50s. When economic realities hit, those retirement ages were hauled up but it is always possible that governments in search of a cheap popular hit will refuse to bend to popular to economic reality. Sorry. In 2010, President Nicolas Sarkozy managed against stiff opposition to raise the retirement age in France from 60 to 62. Two years later, his successor, Francois Hollande, lowered it back down to 60. There will always be those who protest about the idea of working into their 60s, but perhaps some people will see working longer in a society they know as being preferable to dying in one, which, one in which they feel a stranger. And although there are those who argue that there would not be work for the graying workforce, this requires a serious consideration of how to shift the economy in order to improve the productivity among the graying community. In a 2012 interview, Chancellor Merkel of Germany succinctly laid out the continent's challenge, quote, if Europe today accounts for over 7% of the world's population, produces around 25% of global GDP, and has to finance 50% of global social spending, then it's obvious that it will have to work very hard to maintain its prosperity and way of life. All of us have to stop spending more than we earn every year. There are a huge range of possible answers to this problem, and none of them are simple. But the most needlessly complex answer of all is to import huge migrant populations into a society to make up the workforce base of the next generation. Firstly, because the unpredictable factors in the area are legion. The history of post-war immigration into Europe has been a story of people not doing what they were expected to do. Although European governments may think that they know how the next generation of migrants is likely to contribute to the national economy, there is no evidence that they ever correctly predicted any of the previous ones. There are also predictable factors that are wholly ignored, such as the facts that immigrants get old as well. 
Surprising though it appears to be to many policymakers, importing large numbers of young immigrants does not solve the graying population issue. Because immigrants are people, and gray as well. And when they do so, they will expect and deserve the same rights as everybody else in their society. The logical conclusion is that the short-term solution becomes an even greater long-term headache, because there will be a constant need to import larger and larger numbers of people, as in a pyramid scheme, in order to keep more and more in the style to which they have become accustomed. At the same time, in every European country, we hear the argument that there are jobs young Europeans in particular won't do. Where it is true, it is a consequence of welfare provisions that in some situations have made it better to avoid work than to take low-paid work. But it is also a, a result of young people being educated to a level at which they look down on apparently mundane or unglamorous labor. It is a societal viewpoint which is remarkably widespread. The suggestion goes, for instance, that we need to bring in people to stack shelves in supermarkets, a job that has become emblematic, because, it is un because of its undesirability to native-born Europeans. During Britain's EU debate, one millionaire pro-EU entrepreneur insisted that migration into Britain was necessary because he didn't want his daughter to become a potato picker. Aside from the racial insinuation that we are above such roles whereas others are eminently suited to them, we should ask ourselves why our young people are, if they are, above such tasks. It is also necessary to ask ourselves whether we are entirely happy with this payoff. There are many young people across Europe who are unemployed. Many do not have the skills necessary for high-end employment. So why import people to do the low-skilled work when so many workers already exist in Europe? Sometimes mass, Im mass immigration is advocated because of the advantage it gives in supporting pensioners, sometimes because of the advantage it allegedly gives in stopping young people from doing jobs they don't want. But in both cases, it is an argument that if allowed to run will only encourage a greater and greater problem with every year that passes, as more aging people need support and as fewer young people have any chance of getting into work. It is a habit Europe has gotten into, and one which becomes harder to kick with each passing year. The Argument of Diversity One of the most striking things about the arguments for ongoing mass migration into European countries is that they are so readily able to shift. Whenever the economic cases for mass immigration are briefly dislodged, along come moral or cultural arguments. Without making any concession, they state a position along these lines saying, let us pretend that mass migration does not make us financially richer. It does not matter because mass migration makes us rich in other ways. In fact, even if it makes us financially poorer, what you lose in economic benefits, you will pick up in cultural benefits. This argument takes it as read that European societies are slightly boring or staid places, a presumption that would not go down as well in many other societies. The suggestion goes that whereas the rest of the world does not need the mass migration from other cultures in order to be improved, the countries of Europe do, and would especially benefit from such movements. It is as though it is, it is agreed that there is a hole at the heart of Europe which needs filling, and without which we would otherwise be poorer. New people bring different culture, different attitudes, different languages, and of course the endlessly cited example of new and exciting cuisine. As with most of the arguments in favor of mass migration, there is some truth in this. Despite Europe's already, already existing proliferation of languages, cultures, and cuisine, who would not want to increase their knowledge of the world and its cultures? And if any other culture does not want to gain from a knowledge of the rest of the world, then surely it is the one which will be poorer for it. Nevertheless, the argument rests on a number of fallacies. The first is that the best way to learn about the world and its cultures is not to travel around the world, but to encourage the world to come to you, and then stay. The second fallacy is that the value of migrants continues to increase as their numbers increase, so that if one person from a wholly different culture arrives in town, then the town benefits from that culture, and that if another person follows, then that town doubly benefits, and thereafter continues to benefit with each new person. But the knowledge or benefit of a culture does not increase incrementally with the number of people from that culture. Food is one of the benefits that is rather embarrassingly seized upon in this argument. 
But to take that example, the amount of enjoyment to be got from Turkish food does not increase year on year the more Turks there are in the country. Every 100,000 extra Somalis, Eritreans, or Pakistanis who enter Europe do not magnify the resulting cultural enrichment 100,000 times. It may be that Europe has already learned what it needs to learn from cuisine, and accordingly gained all that it needs to gain, and that in order to continue to join Indian food, it will not be necessary to keep on importing more Indians into the society. If it is the case that diversity is a good in itself, it does not explain why in each country immigrants overwhelmingly come from a small number of countries. If you actively sought to bring diversity to Europe after the first decades of mass migration, it would have been sensible to search for people not just from former colonies, but from countries which had never been colonies, and countries about which there was a genuine lack of knowledge. However, behind the insistence on diversity as a good in and of itself lies another idea, albeit one that is perhaps less presentable to the general public. Although New Labor's 2000 document was meant to be an economic analysis, it was the social aspect of migration that most interested one of its authors. In a book she had edited in 1994 titled Strangers and Citizens, A Positive Approach to Migrants and Refugees, Sarah Spencer of the Center on Migration Policy and Society at Oxford argued that, quote, the days when holding British nationality rested on a notion of allegiance are over, end quote. Elsewhere, she and her co-authors had argued that the nation-state had changed and that the modern state had become an open and formal association capable of accommodating diverse ways of life, and that in the state, immigration policy must be seen also as a means of enriching the cultural diversity of the country. A year later, Spencer was quoting approvingly in another publication the idea that the traditional concept of nationality may be downgraded to the level of pure symbolism and arguing herself that we are a diverse society of overlapping identities and are not bound, nor can we be bound, by universal values or single loyalties. If we are to be bound together, it must be through the mutual enjoyment of rights and responsibilities. This was a radically different understanding of what constituted a people or a country, and one with profound and, for for most of the public, unpalatable connotations. Sarah Spencer outlined these in 2003 when she wrote about the idea of integration, that it is not something the migrant does to adapt to the host society, but rather a two-way street of adaptation by migrant and host society. If you, if you tell people they will gain from migration, that is a positive thing. If you tell them that they will have to change because of migration, that is likely to go down less well. And so the positive part is the only part that is stressed. But the argument for mass migration on the grounds of diversity as being a good in itself ignores one huge and until recently unspeakable issue. Just as most cultures have good and interesting things to say for themselves, all have some bad and disagreeable things about them too. And while the positives can be stressed and exaggerated from the outset, any negatives take years to admit, if they are admitted at all. One need only consider the decades it has taken to admit that some immigrant groups hold less liberal views than the majority of the countries into which they have migrated. A Gallup survey conducted in 2009 in Britain found that precisely 0% of British Muslims interviewed out of a pool of 500 thought that homosexuality was morally acceptable. Another survey carried out in 2016 found that 52% of British Muslims thought that homosexuality should be made illegal. The common response to such findings is that these were the attitudes of many British people a generation or two ago. The unspoken follow-on is that homosexuals in Britain should be patient and wait another generation or two for the newcomers to catch up. All the while, what is ignored is the possibility that this might not happen, and that the views of the incomers may in time, through population growth or other means, change the national picture as a whole. So in 2015, when YouGov carried out a survey of British attitudes toward homosexuality, one of the questions asked was whether in general respondents thought homosexuality to be morally acceptable or morally wrong. Some people might have assumed that such a survey would smoke out latent homophobia in certain rural areas, whereas the hip, diverse urban areas would show that they were relaxed about the whole matter. In fact, the findings showed precisely the opposite. 
whereas the whole rest of the country, around 16% of people said that they thought homosexuality was morally wrong. In London, the figure was almost double that, 29%. Why should people in London have been almost twice as homophobic as the rest of the country? solely for the reason that the ethnic diversity of the capital meant that it had imported a disproportionate number of people with attitudes which the rest of the country would now regard as being morally backwards. But if the views of some migrant communities on homosexuality were only a couple generations out of date, the views of portions of those communities on the subject of women were shown to be out of date by many centuries, at least. It was in the early 2000s in England that stories that the Sikh and white working class communities had been telling for years were finally investigated by the media. These revealed that the organized grooming of often underage young girls by gangs of Muslim men or of North African or Pakistani background was a theme in towns throughout the north of England and further afield. In each case, the local police had been too scared to look into the issue, and when the media finally looked into it, they too shied away. A 2004 documentary on social services in Bradford had its screening postponed after self-proclaimed anti-fascists and local police chiefs appealed to Channel 4 to document to drop the documentary. The sections that dealt with the sexual exploitation of white girls by Asian gangs were accused of being potentially inflammatory. In particular, these authorities insisted the scre- the, in particular, these authorities insisted the screening ahead of local elections could assist the British National Party at the polls. The documentary was finally screened months after the elections, but everything about this case and the details that followed provided a microcosm of the problem and a reaction which were going to spread across Europe. Campaigning on or even mentioning the issue of grooming during those years brought with it terrible problems. When the Northern Labor MP Anne Cryer took up the issue of the rape of underage girls in her own constituency, she was swiftly and widely denounced as an Islamophobe and a racist, and at one stage had to receive police protection. It took years for central government, the police, local authorities, or the Crown Prosecution Service to face up to the issue. When they finally began to do so, an official inquiry into abuse in the town of Rotherham alone revealed the exploitation of at least 1,400 children over the period 1997 to 2014. The victims were all non-Muslim white girls from the community, with the youngest aged 11. All had been—I'm going to skip this scene or this paragraph— The local police were also found to have failed to act for fear of accusations of racism and of what this might do to community relations. The story of Rotherham, like that of a whole series of similar cases in towns across Britain, partly emerged because a couple of journalists were determined to bring the story out. But all the time, the communities from which the men came showed no willingness to confront the problem and every desire to cover it up. Even at the courts after sentencing, families of those accused claimed the whole thing was a government stitch-up of some kind. When one Muslim in the north of England spoke out against the gang rape of white girls by members of his own community, he said that he had received death threats from fellow Muslims in Britain for saying so. Everywhere, the story was the same. Girls were chosen, in the words of the judges who eventually presided over the trials, because they were from a different community— were non-Muslim and were regarded as easy prey. Many of the men had brought ideas about women and especially unaccompanied with them from Pakistan and other male-dominated Muslim cultures. In the face of such attitudes towards women being expressed in the UK, every part of the British state failed to stand up for what had been British norms, including the rule of law. The kindest explanation would be that the influx of huge numbers of people from such cultures made the authorities nervous as to where to draw their own lines. But it was more than that. Every time grooming scandals occurred, it transpired that the local authorities turned a blind eye for fear of causing community problems or being accused of racism. The British police remained scarred for the McPherson Report of 1999, which had charged them with institutional racism and feared any repeat of that accusation. Everywhere in Western Europe, the same truth came out at least equally slowly, often at almost precisely the same moment as the taboo shattered in Britain. 
In each country, the period of silence was assisted by the refusal of the authorities to keep or break down any crime statistics based on ethnicity or religion. In 2009, police in Norway revealed that immigrants from non-Western backgrounds were responsible for all reported grab rapes, those in which the assailant grabbed a woman off the street or a public place in Oslo. In 2011, the Norwegian State Statistical Bureau was willing to note that immigrants are overrepresented in the crime statistics. They did, however, also suggest that was, this was not due to any cultural differences, but rather perhaps to the predominance of young men among the immigrant populations. One former head of the violent crime section of the Oslo Police Department, Hanna Kristin Rohde, testified to the extraordinary unwillingness of the Norwegian authorities to admit to what was happening. In relation to the clear statistical connection between rapes and migrants who came from cultures where women know have, have no value of their own, she said that this was a big problem, but it was difficult to talk about it. As for the rapist attitude towards women's, Rody said it is a cultural problem. Obviously, these and similar cases of rape gangs are an unusual and unrepresentative example of the behavior of immigrants as a whole. They ought, however, to be the easiest misbehaviors imaginable to discover, investigate, and punish. That it has taken years, and in some cases decades, even for police and prosecutors to face up to the problems, throws, a deep, throws open a deeply troubling possibility. These cases, like female genital mutilation, ought to be easier to deal with. But Western European societies have struggled for years even remotely to get to grips with the problem. Others less prominent or other less prominent or violent attitudes that some migrant groups bring with them are unlikely ever to achieve a similar degree of inspections if cases such as these are hard to grapple with. If the large-scale gang rape of children takes more than a decade to come to light, how long will less violent and horrific examples of untoward attitudes come to light, if they ever do? One thing this demonstrates is that whereas the benefits of mass immigration undoubtedly exist— and everyone is made very aware of them. The disadvantages of importing huge numbers of people from another culture take a good deal of time to admit to. In the meantime, the agreement seems to have been reached with the general public that it is not such a bad deal. If there is a bit more beheading and sexual assault than there used to be in Europe, then at least we also benefit from a much wider range of cuisines. That was sarcasm. The idea that immigration is unstoppable because of globalization. The final justification or excuse for mass immigration goes beyond reason and beyond excuses. Even if every other argument for the policy were debunked, this one would remain. It is the argument that none of this matters because nothing can be done anyway. It is all out of everybody's hands. It is our fate. Towards the start of the current crisis, I was involved in a debate in Athens about Europe's policies towards the immigration situation and what they should be. While presenting my argument, I made the observation that the others present, including the Greek economist Antigone Liberaki, Liberaki and the French politician and activist Bernard Kushner, were likely to tell the audience that nothing could be done. Only afterwards, when Bernard put down his pre-prepared speech, did I see that he had crossed out the first line before his delivery. The speech was indeed due to open, with the insistence that Europe could not stop the flow coming into Greece and that nothing could be done. It is a familiar cry, though when alerted to it, the wiser politicians often realize that it is a potentially disastrous one. Meanwhile, leading politicians, including in 2015, Britain's then Home Secretary, Theresa May, have claimed that European countries must try to improve living standards in third world countries in order to prevent people coming here. Yet, the truth is, as many studies have shown, that it is only when living standards rise, though hardly to luxurious levels, that the mass migration truly begins. Truly poor people do not have the money to bribe the smugglers. There are also attempts to give this view a veneer of academic respectability. In recent years, a line has grown in academic discourse around the subject of migration, which insists that migration flows are actually caused by any and all migration controls. The work of, among others, Hein de Haas of the universities of Oxford and Maastricht insists that migration controls not only 
do not work, but actually boost migration by discouraging the normal circulation of migrants between Europe and their home countries. A favorite line in academia, this is also of course an argument that is only ever made by people who observe any and all controls on migration. Before pointing out the unexploded democratic explosive, unexploded democratic explosive behind this, it is worth considering what is true in the claim. Certainly the prevalence of mobile phones, mass media, especially television, in the third world and the lowered cost of travel over recent decades meant that the desire and opportunity of people all over the world to travel has never been greater. But if globalization really has made it impossible to prevent people traveling to Europe from across the world, it is worth noting that this global issue does not affect other countries. If the cause is economic pull, then there is no reason why Japan should not currently be experiencing unparalleled waves of immigration from the West. In 2016, the country was the world's third largest economy if measured by nominal GDP, putting it ahead of Germany and Great Britain. But, of course, despite being a larger economy than any in Europe, Japan has avoided a policy of mass immigration by implementing policies that stop it, dissuade people from staying there, and make it hard to become a citizen if you are not Japanese. Irrespective of whether one agrees with Japan's policy or not, the country shows that even in this hyper-connected age, it is possible for a modern economy to avoid the experience of mass immigration and show that such a process is not inevitable. In the same way, although China is the world's second largest economy, it is not a destination for asylum seekers nor economic migrants on the scale of Europe. Ignoring whether this is desirable or not, it is obviously possible for even the richest countries not to inevitably become points of attraction for migrants from all over the world. The reason people wish to come to Europe is not only because of the perception of wealth and work. It is also because Europe has made itself a desirable destination for additional reasons. Not least among them is the knowledge that Europe is likely to allow arrivals to remain in the continent once there. High among the reasons why people flock to Europe are the knowledge of its welfare that its welfare states will look after migrants who arrive, and the knowledge that however long it takes or however poorly migrants may be looked after, they will still enjoy a better standard of living and a better roster of rights than anywhere else, let alone in their home countries. There is also the belief, flattering to Europeans as well as true, that Europe is a more tolerant, peaceful, and welcoming place than most of the world. If there were such co- many such continents in the world, then Europeans might be able to enjoy their status as one generous society among many. If the perception grows that Europe is in fact the only place where it is both easy to get in, easy to remain, and safe to stay, then the continent may find the resulting attention less flattering in the long term than it does in the short term. In any case, it is not inevitable that the world's migrants should come to Europe. They come because Europe has made itself, for reasons good and some bad, attractive to the world's migrants. Something clearly can be done. Whether desirable or not, if Europe had to limit the flow, it could take measures to make itself look, and actually be, in a whole range of ways, less appealing to a world on the move. It could adopt a sterner face to the world, return people who should not be there, provide what stop providing the welfare provisions to new arrivals and adopt a more first-come, first-served basis for welfare policy in the future. If migration is caused by allure, then a way needs to be found to lose the allure. These are unpleasant things to consider, not least because they affect one of the views of ourselves that Europeans like to hold, and it might even be, in the long run, alter that self-perception. But the road may not be as perilous as some people fear. Few would argue that Japanese is a barbarous country for implementing its strict migration rules. In any case, the idea that what Europe is going through is unstoppable is a dangerous one, not just because it is untrue, but because of the trouble it stores up. For many years, across Western Europe, the issue of migration has been at the top of the list of public concerns. Opinion polls in each country consistently show the issue to be of almost overriding concern to the general public. If a concern is felt by a majority of the public for many years and nothing is done to address it, then trouble and resentment are certainly stored up. 
if the response is not just to ignore the concern, but to argue that it is that it is actually impossible to do anything about it, then radical alternatives begin to brew. At best, such concerns will be expressed at the ballot box. At worst, they will surface on the streets. It is hard to think of any other issue, let alone one so high up on the list of public concerns, that would be responded to with the uh, nothing-can-be-done response. Even this final fatalistic response to the problem is a result of a policy that was never thought through and now appears to have become, in the eyes of politicians and academics, essentially insuperable. After all, one after another the expectations about what would happen turned out to be false, and the realities of what did happen turned out either not to have been thought out or thought out erroneously. Consider the verdict of one of those who enabled the post-1997 labor government to escalate their policy when they did. After her work for the British government, Sarah Spencer was awarded with the honor of a CBE. But by then, when some of the repercussions of her evangelism and that of others had begun to be felt, she made a more lachrymose assessment, admitting that during those years in government, when she and her colleagues had opened the floodgates, quote, there was no policy for integration. We just believed migrants would integrate, end quote. All this was years before the biggest crisis that confronts us today, but all returned as foundational arguments to excuse the huge and continent-wide movement that was coming. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.